Well, again, good afternoon. My name is Ben Ike, and I am the manager of state training and communications of 11 Center at Wayne State University Law School. Before we get underway, I, I want to say a few words about the Levin Center. Former U.S. Senator Carl Levin founded the Levin Center in 2015 with a mission to advance bipartisan, fact-based oversight and civil discourse as instruments of change. In the past few years, the Levin Center has trained hundreds of congressional staff in the techniques of bipartisan, fact-based oversight. We conduct workshops in state legislatures across the country. We support and conduct research on important oversight topics and advocate for the right of the legislative branch to conduct oversight to ensure transparency and accountability. We are always happy to discuss legislative oversight in ways to enhance the work being done in DC and across the country to find facts and enhance civil discourse on contentious topics. Oversight hearings are a powerful tool for showcasing the importance of a legislative investigation. They are an opportunity for the media to cover key legislative branch priorities and a chance to work with your colleagues to pursue truth. Just as written documents are essential to effective oversight, quality questions at an oversight hearing can solve problems, ensure accountability, and improve overall legislative effectiveness. In today's webinar, we will hear from Elise Bean, who is director of the Levin Center's Washington office. Elise will discuss how to prepare the hearing questions that deliver results. After Elise's presentation, we will have a question and answer period that I will moderate. Then I will close things out with some brief concluding remarks. We encourage everyone in our audience to submit questions via the Zoom question function, and our team will do our best to get to as many of your questions as we can. Please welcome Elise Bean. Thank you, Ben. Um, thank all of you for joining us today. I spent 30 years doing oversight investigations for Senator Carl Levin and did uh, lots and lots of oversight hearings. Uh, I've spent the last five years doing oversight training workshops for both congressional and state legislators and staff. And I've also consulted with a lot of offices that are doing oversight investigations. So it's that experience that provides the basis for the tips that I hope to share with you today. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna look at oversight generally, and we're gonna talk about techniques that you can use to ask better questions at oversight hearings. And then we'll act, talk about what actually happens during a hearing and what do you do if you have to improvise. So as Ben said, if you have any questions, use the Q&A function on the Zoom screen. Uh, we'll try to answer them along the way or at the end. So let's get started. First slide, please. Let's go to the next one. Okay, basics. Why should you bother to ask good questions at an oversight hearing? Well, they can be key to getting something done, brings visibility to problems, elevates issues, uh, and so they have more of a chance to be addressed and they can stop misconduct. So there are a lot of good policy reasons. Uh, I list a couple of them up there, get information to solve a problem, help the public as well as your colleagues in the media to understand an issue. Maybe you can hold some responsible parties accountable. And of course you can improve the legislature's effectiveness which helps all of us have greater uh, public trust in government. There's also a couple of personal reasons that you might wanna ask good questions at an oversight hearing. First of all, you might wanna attract the notice of your leadership. And that could be the leaders of your committee, uh, of your entire chamber, as well as your colleagues. Uh, you might want to impress the media that you're sharp, that you do your homework, that you care about a particular issue, and you might want to impress your voters in the same way. All of those are reasons why you want to look good at an oversight hearing. And as we all know, in a state legislature, everyone knows pretty quickly who's good at asking questions, who does their homework, who's a benefit to their committee, and who isn't. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the constitutional basis for doing oversight by a legislature. Uh, courts have found that oversight is a key legislative responsibility and it's integral to the job. A hundred years ago, the Supreme Court said a legislative body cannot legislate wisely or effectively in the absence of information. And 
I'm sure from your own experience, you know, if you're going to make decisions about spending, about changes to a program, uh, about a new law, uh, it's best to work from facts. Uh, it's, the courts have also made it clear that oversight needs to have a legislative purpose. It uh, has to have something to do with your obligations as a legislator because you're not a prosecutor, can't throw anybody in jail, you can't find them. What you wanna do with respect to congressional or state oversight hearings is to address policy issues and to find out what's going on. As the Supreme Court said just last year, it's the proper duty of a representative body to look diligently into every affair of government meant to be the eyes and voice and to embody the wisdom and will of its constituents. So that's what we're doing in oversight. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about oversight hearings in particular. The main thing to understand is these are not legislative hearings. The main purpose of the hearing is not to draft or enact a specific bill. Instead, an oversight hearing is what happens in response when a problem is uncovered, maybe even a scandal, or if you're doing routine oversight to try to improve a government program or an agency or department. So that's what oversight hearings do. And for that reason, they're all about the facts. They want to establish what happened if there's a problem and why. They want to provide evidence to prove that that's what happened. Sometimes they want to hold parties accountable for actions that are taken. And the big point is to produce policy reforms to improve government. So that's the purpose of oversight hearings writ large. Because of that, oversight hearings uh, in, the, in the best of all worlds spend about 80% of the time describing the problem. Because you wanna understand again, what happened and why the larger context the role of rules and all the rest of it. And you can only do that when you're really digging into the problem. You wanna spend no more than 20% on the solution. And the reason for that is if you spend most of your time on the solution, because that's sometimes a lot more fun to talk about than talking about the problem, but you're putting the cart before the horse. Nobody's gonna to wanna to have to do the hard work of passing a new law or changing sp spending or making other policy reforms unless they understand the reason, what the problem is. So next slide. So when you're at an oversight hearing, the goal of your oversight questions in general should be to establish facts, provide evidence to support those facts, explain what happened and its significance. And of course, just these functions, getting consensus on the facts sounds simple, but we all know it isn't. It is hard to get people to agree on what happened and why. So that is a big goal of your oversight questions. In addition, you might wanna hold a party accountable, either for misconduct or because they're a person who can make a difference. And of course, all of this is you're trying to provide a foundation again for those policy reforms. Now, when you think about it, um, a lot of times oversight hearings deal with things that are difficult. Uh, if they're easy, nobody has a hearing on them. So there's usually something, you know, in the news today, we had an oil spill out in California. What happened exactly? Why did it happen? What's the role of the rules? There's a lot of other uh, situations you can think that might fall into that category. Problems with foster care. You might have a death in prison or a prison riot. Uh, you might have a, an employee who embezzled funds. How did that happen? You might have a pension program that has very low returns. Uh, so again, the point of oversight questions is to find out the facts, what happened and prove it with evidence. Next slide, please. Now, this isn't really easy. It, it can be a very difficult task because you've got a lot of constraints uh, when you're asking questions at a hearing. First of all, you might have a time constraint. Maybe you only have five minutes for your question, in which case it's very tough to get out information unless you plan carefully ahead of time. Uh, sometimes you have a terrific question. You're all ready to go, but uh, the person in front of you asked your question. So what are you supposed to do then? Another constraint on you is you may have a hostile witness, somebody who's going to uh, misrepresent what happened or maybe not answer your questions fully. And so you're gonna have to deal with that. 
And again, because hearings are live uh, events, they're not prescripted, you never know really what's gonna happen, what a witness is going to say. They could say something very misleading or they could just say something is out of left field and you have to think about how you wanna react. And finally, we all know that legislators have a million things on their plates. They are supposed to be doing all kinds of things all the time. So it may be difficult for them to find time to, to get prepared for a particular oversight hearing. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about some techniques to asking better questions at oversight hearings. We we'll talk about three things in general. First of all, preparation, 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 how you find it, what you do to prepare. Second of all, using formatted written questions ahead of time that will set you up for success. This is the single most important thing you can do to improve your hearing performance. And finally, we'll talk about the role of hearing charts, exhibits, and props. Next slide, please. So when we talk about preparation, the first thing we should think about is witness preparation. So the witnesses have the facts. They're gonna be the people that appear in front of you. So in the best of all worlds, you would have your personal staff meet with each witness to get a sense of them, what they know, how they're gonna answer certain questions. But a lot of times you can't do that. If it's a top official, they don't have time to meet with your staff. Or it may, that, may be that the committee does the meetings with the specific witnesses and your staffer can't get into those meetings. Of course, they can still meet with committee staff and try to get a sense from them about what each witness uh, knows and how they might answer particular questions. Um, when you decide uh, at that meeting, if your staff or committee staff goes and meets with that witness, you want to test key documents. If you show them a document, how are they going to react to it? How are they going to explain to it? You wanna to try, test certain questions to see how they're gonna respond. And that's also to educate you about what exactly happened. Another important thing to do when you do witness preparation is determine is the witness friendly or hostile? Are they gonna help you out or are they gonna make your life difficult at the hearing? Uh, if they're friendly, you can actually talk to each other. You can uh, offer each other advice on what would be useful in their testimony. Uh, you could offer each other possible questions and how they would be answered. You can uh, test uh, what might be asked so that uh, your boss will know or the legislator will know uh, how they're going to respond. Next slide, please. Then of course, there's legislator preparation. Uh, your, the legislator's performance at the hearing is directly related to how much homework they do beforehand. For big hearings or hearings in which the legislator wants to impress the committee chair or their colleagues, the media or their voters, you need to do some extra prep. So what does that actually mean? The most important thing it means is that you have some meetings with your staff or committee staff or both who know about the hearing. That means you need to schedule time, say I'm going to meet you at one o'clock, at this particular location, and we're gonna talk about the hearing. You have to schedule time. And my recommendation is don't have one big meeting where you think you're gonna learn everything all at once in like an hour long meeting. You could do that, but it's very difficult. A better way to go is to have a couple of short meetings so that you can hear the same facts more than once. They can start to sink in and you can start to think about what questions you have. So what do you do those actual meetings? Well, the most important thing is you ask the staffer who's there, who called the meeting and why. And you wanna understand that from the perspective of the chair and the ranking, because they often have different perspectives, different uh, issues that they're interested in. And you wanna understand why they care about that issue and also why the legislator should care about the hearing. If they don't think, if they don't care, they shouldn't even bother to go to the hearing. So they have to find out why should they care about the hearing. And that means finding out the key controversies, the key issues, who's affected, uh, and what could be accomplished by the hearing. And in particular, what the legislator could personally accomplish by attending the hearing and asking questions. For big hearings, some committees meet ahead of time and they divvy up questions. So a specific legislator doesn't have to be an expert on everything, they can focus their effort. Uh, and even if the committee doesn't do that, 
a legislator could communicate to the staff, the committee staff, this is what I'm most interested in. This is what I'm gonna be prepared to ask about. And then the committee gets that sense and might even tell other people, don't ask about that because this legislator is going to really focus on that. So in these legislative preparatory meetings, you wanna understand the purpose and goals of the hearing from those perspectives and what you can accomplish. And I would advise preparing at least three questions. Of course, if you're in charge, you wanna do a lot more than that, but assuming that you're just attending the hearing as a committee member, you wanna have three questions. Why three? Because you wanna have a little bit of choice. You might not like one of the questions that your staff comes up with, or it doesn't feel right in the moment. And uh, perhaps you wanna be able to say, oh, you know, I thought I wanted to do this, but now I wanna do that. And if somebody asks your best question just before you, you want to have another alternative uh, that you can use as well. So prepare three questions. If any of those questions use a chart, a document, or some sort of prop, you want to review that, understand that, so that you're, you understand how the question is intended to work. And again, you want to discuss what is it that you're trying to achieve and the important and purpose of each question. I'll just mention, uh, well, let's go to the next slide. So Senator Levin was a bit of an outlier. He prepared more for oversight hearings than anyone I've ever seen, but that's why he was so good. And if you see that little photograph of him, you can see he's holding up one of his questions and there's highlights and there's ink in different colors. That's because he went over his questions more than once. And his technique was to hold multiple short meetings. Maybe the meeting would be only 15 minutes long, but as he would hear about the hearing again and again, he would start to understand it. And what he liked to do was write out his opening statement if he had one and his questions. And he would look at the documents. He would look at any uh, chart. He might design a chart uh, that would go with the question and he would make sure that he understood the facts, the documents, the purpose, the goals of his questions. So um, we advise you writing out your questions ahead of time. That if there's only one thing you take from uh, this seminar today, this webinar, is that you should write out your questions ahead of time, actually write them out. We advise putting one question per page, one topic per page so that you can shuffle them up or if somebody, something doesn't look good anymore, you can just throw that one away and use the ones you still have. Um, we recommend saying right at the top, what's the topic of this question? Who are you gonna ask? Who's the target of the question? And then in the question itself, you want it set up in such a way that you're setting a stage for the audience, also reminding yourself the context for your question. You wanna have something that makes very clear what is your actual question? You wanna attach any needed information. If there's a document, a chart, whatever, you wanna attach it, highlight it, so you have it right there. You want to have some indication about how the witness is likely to answer, so you know where you're going. And it's always good to have a follow-up question with a likely answer, so uh, you look really smart in case a person asks really quickly, uh, you have something to follow up with. And of course, again, you want to attach any referenced materials. Okay, so let's take an example of that. So here's a formatted question. Next slide, please. So right at the top, this is the kind of structure we're talking about. This is a question for Chris Green, so you know exactly who you're asking. And the topic is incriminating emails and phone calls. So that's, now you know what you're gonna talk about. Q, here's your question. Chris Green, please turn to hearing exhibit 20 in the exhibit book. If you're gonna be using any document that has a number attached to it, you want your staff to get that number ahead of time and you want them to put it in your question so that you look really smart and sharp, uh, not only for the media and your voters, but for the witnesses and your colleagues so that everybody knows exactly what you're doing. Uh, you, uh, you also want to make sure that you've shared any exhibit ahead of time uh, with the committee staff so they know what you're going to use. Okay, so please turn to exhibit 20 and then you describe it. This is not difficult, but a lot of times you have to describe things so that your audience understands what you're looking at. This is an email that you wrote on a certain date, right after the events we're concerned about. In the second sentence, you write, quote, John Brown just called in with the information, end quote. Did I read that accurately? 
So this is a very fun technique if you're trying to get evidence into the record to show that certain things happened, to prove to get consensus on the facts, you can just read them into the record and say, did I read that accurately? Handy little question. Now we have A, the answer. They expect the witness to say yes, that you read that accurately. Your next question. Doesn't this email show you were immediately informed of the events in question? Again, you have an answer. The witness will say they have no recollection of John calling or of the email. So now you know what the witness is going to say. Next uh, slide, please. So we have an, another question, a follow-up question. The email shows not only the date, but also the precise time it was sent. 11 a.m. The timing is right after the events in question took place, isn't it? Uh, the answer, they should say yes, but they may want to press the point if the witness won't admit it because they admitted you read the stuff accurately before. Are they going to admit this? And you can see this is sort of a conversation between you and your staff, the legislator and the staff, to understand what's going to happen throughout this question. So then they have another follow-up question. Isn't it true your cell phone records also show a call from Susan, the person to whom your email is addressed, about 10 minutes after this email. Do you remember getting that phone call? Witness will say no. And then you have a final remark. My time is up, but it's troubling that you can't recall not only your own email, but the call from John that triggered it and the call with Susan right after it. As far as I'm concerned, that's three strikes in a row. So that's a nice flourish at the end. Very easy to plan ahead of time but pretty hard to remember in the heat of the moment. When a hearing's going on, there's so much happening. It's so easy to get distracted, to forget where you're going, that if you don't write it out ahead of time, it's very easy to mess it up. Now, when you have this, you always wanna have the document attached to it because somebody challenges you about the context of your quote. Oh, you're taking it out of context. You wanna have the document right there with a the highlight for whatever quotes you've used so that the legislator can immediately have that document and say, well, let me tell you the context. I'll read you the whole email if you want me to. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with a formatted, written out a question ahead of time. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So another way to make your questions really lively and highly visible and um, interesting is to use a chart, a document, or a prop. So the first thing you have to do is make sure your committee allows you to use that kind of material. You wanna check with them. You wanna get any exhibit number that you might have to get. You wanna have your staff show committee staff exactly what it is you wanna use. Uh, surprising them is not a good idea at a hearing. It makes everybody mad. They're not prepared for it. If you show it to them ahead of time, very unlikely they're gonna tell you you can't. And you can also discuss it with them and see how they feel about it. They feel your chart is going to cause a lot of questions from your colleagues or cause a lot of questions from the witness. They'll be able to advise you on it. So it's always good to show whatever it is you're going to use ahead of time. So again, you wanna do your work ahead of time to make sure this all works smoothly when the hearing itself is happening. Now, a chart. You wanna use a chart to make a visual statement. People are often process information best when they can see something visually. If you look at that chart on the left, you know something's going on. There's a big line going up, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but there's a visual message from that chart that you're gonna be able to communicate pretty easily. If you have a document that you wanna use, again, that is to provide proof, evidence of a particular fact so that you can get consensus that something actually happened. So hearing exhibits can be very important. They're often not difficult to do, uh, but you, it, it's a useful thing to do in a hearing. Media loves documents. Uh, people are always impressed by documents. One of the best ways uh, you can have a really effective question in an oversight hearing. And then finally, you could use a prop to dramatize the point. If you see that little you know, photograph on the right hand, that was a hearing about CIA covert operations. And just by bringing in that gun, you know this is serious, this is deadly, and you're gonna heighten interest in the hearing itself. Now, there are other, other kinds of props. It doesn't have to be a gun. Uh, you, if you're talking about a cell phone, you might bring a cell phone in. You could bring in a stack of forms to show how complicated something is. 
if you're talking about a carport, a, a part of a car, an auto part that is overpriced, you could bring that part in. Uh, all of those things heighten awareness of your issue. It should be something that will make one of the points you're trying to make and heighten interest again and make your hearing uh, interesting and your questions effective. So next slide, please. Here, I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples of hearing charts at Center 11 used. The first one was used in a tax shelter. Well, what does it tell you immediately? This is a very complicated transaction. It's probably phony. There's phantom trades and Barnville and Jack Stone, you know, what does that all mean? So it immediately uh, communicates that this is a complex, probably sneaky tax strategy. And also just so you know, this is actually how that strategy works. So if, if somebody really cared about it, they could use this chart to actually understand how it worked. Uh, the picture on the right uh, had to do with an investigation into Augusto Pinochet, the former president of Chile, who had opened up secret accounts in US uh, banks and stashed millions of dollars in them. And what we found is that he used different passport photos with each of those banks. So the one in the middle is his usual patrician self with the white hair. The guy on the left all, all of a sudden has black hair and he's got a thick black mustache. The guy on the right is balding. So what does this communicate? Again, that uh, Augusto Pinochet was engaging in sneaky uh, uh, transactions. He was hiding his role in them. And of course it elevates great interest because people find that pretty interesting to look at. Uh, the chart in the lower uh, left-hand corner, uh, we just took a quote from one of the documents because sometimes you have a document, but what does it say? So we take a particular quote here. This was a hearing about Enron and how they were hiding debt. Enron loves these deals uh, as they are able to hide funded debt from their equity analysts. Uh, and it just explains what's going on that everybody knew what Enron was doing, including its banks. The chart on the right-hand side had to do with tax haven banks and how they were helping US clients cheat on their taxes. And it has a long list of sneaky tricks that they use, they call them secrecy tricks. And it, it combines a lot of different information in one uh, place uh, that again, in a hearing, you could go through each one of those with a witness and say, well, explain this to me, code names for clients. What does that mean? What do you mean they used pay phones? All of that kind of stuff. So these are examples of hearing charts that make your, in, your hearing interesting and also make one of the primary points that you're trying to make uh, in the hearing. Next slide. So let's talk about what happens during the hearing itself. First of all, you want to have staff there if possible. And you always want to ask your staff to bring copies of your three questions because maybe you lost them, maybe you spilled coffee on them, you can't find them at the last minute. You always want to have a backup set uh, that you can bring to the hearing. Once you get there, the best thing to do is ask your staff or committee staff to just brief you on what's happening in the hearing. What's the tone? Are people being combative, cooperative? Is any witness being particularly obnoxious? Is there some new development that nobody knew was gonna happen? So you just kind of get a sense of the hearing if you can't be there from the very beginning. Often you may wanna ask staff advice on which of your three questions you should ask. Has somebody else already asked this? And if somebody has, uh, you can have your staff say, well, what did they actually ask? Did they get into the things that we're concerned about? And you can also uh, ask that question again, just give credit to the person who asked it before. And, and that will enable you to ask the question anyway. Um, okay, next slide. I wanna give you just a sample of some useful questions that uh, you can often use in an oversight hearing. As I mentioned earlier, you can simply recite facts. You could read a document, an email, and just say, did I get that right? Always useful, getting information into the record, and then did I get that right? You can cite a specific uh, document or quotation. Did I read that right? Very useful question. You could also ask a witness to talk about these facts and say, does that trouble you? And that's an interesting question because you're not accusing them of wrongdoing, but you're also raising questions and about, does that trouble you? And then of course, if they say no, you could say why well, it troubles the legislator, why they find it trouble. If you're gonna use a chart, you can show how it, it portrays a particular fact or trend, 
But as I've mentioned before, you want to test that beforehand. So you don't say that's what it shows and somebody, even your own colleague, challenge you uh, in the hearing itself. You don't want to have that happen. If you know that a witness has already said, you know, something like, you know, you're talking about stuff that happened a long time ago, we've already fixed the problem. That should be a terrific opening for you to say, I am very pleased to see that you've already made these changes because that admits that you've recognized a problem and, you've start, and you're willing to make reforms and you've already started down that path. So that validates the whole hearing that they recognize there's a problem and they're starting to fix it. So it's always good if a witness has said, I've already made changes. You recognize that, you say, I'm glad you said that, but it also is an admission of a problem and perhaps there's additional things that need to be done. If the person is a friendly witness, and again, that's, you have to establish that ahead of time, that's part of that homework and preparation. You could ask them an open-ended question. What went wrong? How can we do better? And you can only do that if you know that witness, uh, if you know what they're gonna say, because otherwise they might say, say some things that you really don't agree with, and then you're gonna have a fight with that witness. So that really takes uh, preparation ahead of time. And finally, a really terrific question to ask in any oversight hearing is, will you make a commitment to work with my staff on this issue? You can also ask, will you make a commitment to make a specific change? And that creates a public record for how uh, we're going to get to those reforms that you want to see happen. Okay, next slide. What happens if something goes wrong and you have to improvise? There's a new fact, somebody doesn't show up, somebody else has already asked your questions. My recommendation is that you first turn to your staff. Your staff should have been there from the beginning of the hearing. If they're not, you can talk to committee staff and ask them for advice. They can always ask, uh, you can ask them to identify a key issue or a gap. They may have a question that they're hoping somebody would ask, but no one has and say, do you have a question for me? You could read it quickly and because you have background on the issues and the matters, you could decide whether or not to ask that question. A basic rule of thumb is you can always clarify the facts. If somebody already asked something, you can ask it again and say, my friend so-and-so asked that question. I'd like to clarify that a little bit further. That builds goodwill uh, within the committee that you've recognized your colleague. And you also get to focus on something again. And the most important thing to remember is that repetition is your friend. When people watch a hearing, they often uh, can't remember more than one or two points when they leave. So I used to get uncomfortable when Center 11 would say the same thing two, three, four times in a row at the hearing. I'm thinking, gosh, he already said that. And as he explained to me and talked to me, until I say it three times or four times or five times, nobody hears it. So it's really important to remember that repetition is your friend. And finally, if you're completely at odds, consider donating your time to the committee chair or the ranking or a colleague that you know is really um, into that issue, maybe ask a really good question just before you and maybe even get a little time and come back later and ask your question when you've had time to think it through. Okay, next uh, slide for some final thoughts. I would urge you to be respectful during a hearing. You know, the movies always have people yelling and screaming and there's a food fight going on, but you actually get more information with honey than vinegar. And not only that, the public really prefers legislators who are more measured or respectful. That would be my recommendation to you. Second uh, final thought, don't try to surprise a witness. It almost never works out in your favor. Uh, plan ahead of time, facts don't change, and ask about what you know. Don't try to do uh, a big surprise. It, it may not, I've never seen it work out well in, a, in an oversight hearing. Um, avoid questions you don't know the answer to because they can take you down uh, areas that you would have preferred that are not efficient, that are not effective from your point of view. Uh, something that Senator Levin taught me that I think is one of the most important things he taught me is to listen very carefully to the answers that you get. Because a lot of times people don't answer your question or they answer it in a way that's confusing. So really listen and try to clarify the answer. Did I hear you say such and such? Should I understand from your answer such and such? always a very good way to proceed. Another recommendation, go to fewer hearings and do more home homework for the hearings that you attend. Uh, you will come off much better uh, when you have fewer hearings and you can do some homework for them. And finally, always know what you're trying to accomplish. What Senator Levin would often do on his questions is he would write at the top, what is it I want to accomplish? And that would guide his 
questions throughout the oversight hearing. Okay, last uh, um, slide for the moment. Uh, I hope that you agree with me that investigations can find the facts, that legislative investigations can correct disinformation. They can even bridge divides. If you are acting in good faith with your colleagues to find the facts, you can start to uh, bridge those political divides and go for things that just reach that consensus on the facts. That's what oversight is all about. And if you can reach that consensus on what happened and why, those investigations can also produce change. So I'd like to open it up for questions now and uh, see what we have. Thank you so much, Louise. I'm guessing we're waiting for some people to type in some questions. Um, again, on the very bottom, if you see the Q&A, oh, we have one that just came in right now from uh, Lindsay Williams. Uh, do you have some tips for if a witness rambles a long-winded response but doesn't really answer the question? That is one of the more difficult problems in hearing because you don't wanna be rude, but on the other hand, when you have time constraints, it almost forces you to be rude. So what you say to the person is, you know, can I interrupt you there for a minute? This is my question. And I really need a que an answer to this question. Or you can interrupt and say, you know, I hear you talking about X and Y, but my question is this. And that's why you wanna make it very clear in your written questions, what is the question that you want an answer to? And so one time Senator 11 took 15 minutes with the witness, just going back and saying, that's not my question. This is my question. And he communicated how that witness was being really tricky and slimy because they weren't answering the questions. In fact, some of the responses to his question got laughter from the audience. And Senator 11 would say, let me try again. This is my question. And again, being respectful in how you do it, not obnoxious, not arrogant, not communicating that this person uh, doesn't have worth, but you're really trying to get information. A lot of times a useful uh, phrase to use is, I'm really trying to get educated here. I want you to educate the committee on what happened. So here's my question. Okay, uh, are there times Very when good. you can ask questions when you don't know the answer? You can, but it's always dangerous. Um, when you do that, you don't know what the person is going to say, and you need a boss who's quick on their feet and can handle that kind of stuff. Some legislators can, some leg legislators can't. Um, one of the tips that we did, sometimes Senator Levin would get a question fixed in his head that we knew was a terrible question, he was gonna get a terrible answer. But every time we would meet with him, we'd ask the same question. Sometimes we would put those questions right in his materials in the written question, and we would give him his question, and we'd show him what the answer was and why it was such a terrible answer, and he'd look at it and he would cross it out and he wouldn't ask that question. So that's um, another technique that you can use as well. Another question, are there differences between how state legislators should question in oversight hearings versus uh, members of Congress? Not really. Um, I think they look at different kinds of issues. Um, sometimes the partisanship on the congressional level is much more intense than it is on the state level. And so um, I would say that, you know, I, I had friends in the media, I would say, are you going to cover this question, uh, cover this oversight hearing? It's bipartisan, it's a really important issue. And my reporter friends would say, no, it's bipartisan, it's gonna be boring, I'm not gonna cover it. And that's why we only see on the news, hearings that have a lot of conflict and usually partisan conflict, not always, but conflict, because that's what the media likes to cover. But a lot of oversight hearings are not contentious. They're not adversarial. They involve uh, even the legislature and the executive branch working together to try to solve a problem. Next, what is your tactic when data is shared and the recipient of the data dismisses it? It appears the data is being minimized in regards to some issues. Well, I think that's where you have to be prepared. You would say, answer, witness is going to dismiss it. Or if the witness plays down this information, you have a response ready for your legislator. You don't try to wing it off the top of your head and come up with some good rhetoric. 
you try to plan for it ahead of time. And you say, you know, I, I feel like you're downplaying the importance of this data, but I wanna to explain to you why I'm asking you about it and why it is important. And you wanna plan that out ahead of time. Next question. I chair a state legislative committee. One of our challenges has been conflict with the executive branch arguing we are overstepping boundaries by asking tough questions or demoralizing staff by focusing on problems rather than successes. How have others helped the agency understand that 80-20 rule helps us all to do the work better? Well, you know, you're, you're putting your finger on it. A lot of agencies don't appreciate it when you point out the problems. But as I, one of the lines I use is, you know, it's like going to the dentist. Nobody wants to go to the dentist. It's no fun. But if you want to prevent that sore tooth, that toothache from turning into a root canal, we need to deal with it. And when we're done, we're all, the government is going to be healthier. Things are going to work better. The staff or agency, I try to prepare them for ahead of time. I also say, look, I know you want to fix this problem just like we want to fix this problem, but we can't fix it until we understand the problem. So the reason I'm asking you for this data, for these tough questions, is I'm really trying to, again, educate myself, educate the committee, educate the, you know, the chamber about what, it, what this problem is, the nature of it, and how we should go about trying to address it. Boy, a lot of questions here. <laughs> Next one. What tactics and tools are available to a legislator in the minority party if the majority party refuses to even schedule a hearing regarding a specific important issue? Well, that, that is an, you know, a problem that a lot of legislatures um, deal with. And one of the things I would say to you is that, you know, the minority plays an important role. And it plays it even for if your majority party matches uh, the person in the, who's the governor, that governor, you want to help them avoid problems as well. And if you deal with small problems, it prevents them from becoming larger problems. So it's actually a service to your governor, even if the governor doesn't appreciate it at the time. In terms of getting a hearing, that's really the relationship between the chair and the ranking. And, you know, a lot of times people have a rule uh, every, uh, you know, six months, the minority party should get a hearing. And of course, they work it out with the majority. Uh, they agree on the witnesses. And it's really a matter of persuasion. It, it, it is that difficult thing about on state, uh, you know, the state level, people are actually more concerned about government working well and having a bipartisan approach to issues. And I would try to do it that way. Say, look, I think this is something that you're concerned about just like us can we talk about it? Can we ha have a hearing about it? Could I set it up in such a way that it would be acceptable to you? And just try to work it out. I know that's not an easy answer, but that's what I've found has worked in the past. In Kentucky, we're often permitted one question, no follow-ups. So the witness gives me nothing knowing there's no opportunity for follow-up. What does this bring up for you? Well, first of all, you need to work with your legislature to change that rule. No one can do good oversight in that context. You, you can't ask a question, they just don't answer it or they dismiss it. Uh, you can't do good oversight. So I would say for Kentucky, if you take oversight seriously, if you think like I do, you cannot have good government without good oversight and you can't have good oversight without good information, then you need to have, you need to work with your legislators and change that rule because you can't do it uh, in that context. Any pointers for combative witnesses, how to de-escalate? Um, it's often hard in the context of a hearing, people are under a lot of pressure and they often get angry. Um, and one of the things you can do is ahead of time, talk to that witness, say, look, um, we're gonna be asking you about these particular matters. Give them some bullet points, not your actual questions. And we want you to be prepared and we want you to know we're gonna be fair we're gonna to try to educate ourselves and the committee about it. And really hope, we hope you can work with us to educate us about these problems and to solve them. So that's the work you do ahead of time. That's that witness preparation. If that doesn't work and they're just going crazy, um, they're gonna make a very bad impression for themselves. They're gonna hurt themselves with the press and with the media and with you know, the public out there. 
So you can't just let them go ahead and you know hang themselves. Uh, and I would respond in a very respectful way and say, I understand that you're feeling very intensely about these issues. And I understand that uh, you know, this is a high pressure moment for you, but we're really trying to educate ourselves and the public about what happened here. So let me see if I can go back to just get some basic facts. You know, how do you deescalate anyone that it's a tricky thing. How do you interrupt a witness or shut a witness off because they refuse to answer the question? For example, the witness changes the question and answers their own, the question that they want to answer. Well, again, repetition is your friend. You can go back and say, I understand you answered that question, but here's my question and repeat your question. And you can do that for your whole five minutes. If you can get a colleague to donate your time, you can go back later, or maybe your colleague will say, I I'm going to take them up on that. And I'm going to ask you the same questions to try to get that witness to answer. Uh, again, with time constraints, you often look rude interrupting a witness. The way you can do it is say, you know, I'm sorry, can I, can I just interject here? Here's my question. I really would like you to educate us about the answer to this question. Again, with a calm voice, not accusatory, being respectful and trying to get that answer. Okay. Next question. <laughs> All right, let me ask my question more clearly. Hearings are not just gonna happen. There is no relationship between, between the chair and ranking. How can committee members get oversight without a hearing? Okay, without a hearing, that's sort of out of the context of this particular webinar, but I'll just answer it here. One thing you can do is a report. If you've done your own investigation, you found out information, you can write up a report and release it to the press. And then you can also release it with a question, you know, a request for a hearing. Something that some uh, legislators do is they have what they call a round table. So it's not a hearing, you can't subpoena people, you can't make the government show up. But if you have witnesses that want to talk about a problem, you could have a round table. You could invite your colleagues across the aisle and have your round table invite the press. It looks like a hearing, but it's not a hearing. Um, it, it, on the federal level, you're not allowed to lie to legislators, whether it's in a hearing or some other context, it may depend upon your state, whether there's that, you know, a similar kind of prohibition on uh, making false statements, but you could have a round table to talk about it. So report, round table, those are two possible solutions. Next question. What if you plan to address a specific witness, but they send staff instead? How do you modify the questions? Okay, so that's pretty rude of the witness. Uh, you should know ahead of time that that's gonna happen so you don't get caught on the fly. Uh, you could also let that witness know later on. You could make a statement, you know, so-and-so was supposed to be here, but instead of uh, being here to answer our questions and educating us, they've sent their staff instead. We, we don't appreciate that. We might have to have another hearing with the actual witness we invited, but we're gonna go ahead and ask this witness. And you can say, and then you ask your questions, you know, this was intended for your boss or your colleague or whatever. Ask the question, they say, well, I don't know the answer to that because I don't have any firsthand information. And then you, you follow up by saying, you know, that's why we wanted the other person here. They did have firsthand information. Or they say, you know, I can't tell you whether we could do that or not because I don't have the authority. You say, I understand. That's why we wanted the other person there because they do have statutory authority to take that step. So my goodness, that was a flurry of, I, I can tell there's a lot of interest in oversight and it sounds like you've had a lot of experience, uh, viewers, of looking at these issues and dealing with these issues. Uh, I hope this is helpful for you. I hope that this has given you a sense, uh, and given you some tips. Uh, and we're going to try to, we have a, we're actually transitioning to a new website and we're going to have a special section on state oversight. We'll be including this webinar there. Um, we also have other materials that may be able to help you uh, do a, a good job on this. So I'm going to turn this back over to Ben for some concluding remarks. Thanks again, Elise, for uh, what a wonderful, wonderful workshop here. Thank you for sharing your insight. May we all be more prepared now to offer excellent hearing questions at our next oversight hearing. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. As a reminder, 
A recording of today's webinar will be posted on the events section of the Levin Center website, law.wayne.edu forward slash Levin dash center. Everyone who attended today will receive a very brief survey asking you to evaluate today's webinar to help us continue how to improve how we do our work at the Levin Center. For information on future discussions and to stay up to date with all the great things happening at the Levin Center, please follow us on Twitter and like our page on Facebook. Thank you again and have a good Wait afternoon. A I'm just gonna add one more thing. Ben is just <laughs> fabulous in the state oversight field. He also has a listserv of state